Hi, everybody. Hi, my name is Paul. Uh, thank you for taking time out of a precious day to join us tonight. Um, you know, as I go through this uh, conversation that we have with you, it's not going to be a presentation. It's more like a conversation. So please feel free to enter questions you may have uh, into the Q&A or the chat box, that, that whichever. We are broadcasting live from two channels from Zoom and Facebook Live. So uh, please feel free to ask questions or make comments or whatever, okay? Now, um, I have uh, half an hour to talk to you about a lot of the things that we're going to be, be talking about. That's a very short time for a lot of content. So uh, I'll try and cover as much as I can and I'll leave half an hour, hour for you to ask questions. So just relax and have fun today, okay? Um, okay, so yeah, so maybe we, we can start now and just take a look at what we're going to do, okay? Just give me a minute. Okay, so just a brief, uh, uh, a brief about myself actually. So I've been in banking a very long time. I actually was uh, started out in 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 a, a foreign bank, and then I joined HSBC and became subsequently became head of mortgage sales. Uh, I also uh, started the business in 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 ANZ for the mortgage. Now, what's what's interesting for me was that. During the whole period, I had the opportunity to see what happened during SARS, during the the uh, you know the the SARS period, the the global financial crisis. I saw all these things. I saw the market crashes, and I had a lot of opportunity to interact with clients, uh, clients who who had many issues during that period of time. And I wanted to share this with you tonight so that we can see what's going on. Uh, and, and, you know, take steps ahead if we need to, you know, because the government has done a lot of great things for, 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 for the economy. Um, so let's have this conversation, okay? I won't be able to cover everything, but I cover what I think will be interesting for you to take action, okay? Uh, so let's talk about the agenda today, okay? At 8.05, in a few minutes, I'm going to start talking about these strategies. Now, these strategies may or may not uh, be very common to you, but really is to just start you thinking about these processes, see what makes sense for you, uh, and then address issues before they come up, okay? So this is to start your thinking. The other point that I wanted to raise is that if you can share what you learn tonight with your family, with your friends, it's going to be very important because a lot of people are going to be affected uh, by these changes due to COVID-19, okay? So that's the reality. We just have to deal with it. And what the government is doing is fantastic because it gives us time to do, to set things up, okay? The other thing is at 8.30, we'll be addressing uh, Q&A. The reason why we are leaving half an hour for Q&A is because we had a lot of questions come in. Uh, so along the way, I'll be answering these questions if... You know, if uh, you have more questions, just continue to put inside the chat box. Okay, so Zoom, go into Q&A. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, go into Q&A and, and uh, put your questions there. For Facebook Live, submit via the comment section. Uh, so we have uh, my colleagues on both platforms handling the questions. Um, at 8.55, uh, I will wrap up. Wherever I am, uh, we'll have to wrap up. Okay, now we will provide links to the discussion. And also, we will uh, hopefully answer all the questions, but if we don't, um, we will come back to you, okay, and answer these questions in subsequent days. So, uh, maybe I'll just wait one, two more minutes for more people to come in to ask questions and all those things, okay? Um, yeah, think of the questions that are, that are bugging you right now, okay? It's a good opportunity. Now, I'm not an expert. I've just been around a long time. And uh, in my work in Property Guru also, we meet up with a lot of clients and, you know, try and help them through whatever situation they are in. Um, so this is this important. And I'm going to share with you some common misconceptions about, you know, loans and stuff like that. Okay. So please bear with me. I mean, um, if I don't know the answers, I'll check for you and come back to you. So I think, uh, I think we are about set. Let's, let's start. Okay. So before we can talk about the issues that confront us, let's 
try to understand where we, we get our money from. Okay, where do we get our money from? So first one is savings. Uh, obviously, when you, you decide to set 10% of your income, it goes into a savings account or wherever you channel the cash to, that's where your savings. I lump inheritances into this as well. So for example, if uh, some of us have, have uh, you know, parents that leave uh, assets for you that would come in under savings. Um, if I have a prior decision to buy a property and rent it out, if I sell the property, net proceeds will come out of that, okay? After I pay off the loan and whatever, out of pocket expenses. The other thing is about rental returns, right, from the property, if I rent it out or I invest in, in my money in, in bonds, in shares, okay? Also, when I sell the investments and I get back the return. So if you look at this, right, let me set on my, uh, my pointer. So if you look at all these, right, actually these, these points are all decisions already made. Now, if today you say, okay, I need funds, right, and you've never set aside funds, you've never bought the property, this is not accessible to you, okay? So, I mean, you know, we, we just have to take a, a, a snapshot of where we are and then decide uh, where we can go, okay? So the other thing is this. A lot of people tell me, okay, there's salary and bonus. That's where my cash is coming from, right? Um, yes, but salary and bonuses, if you're running your own business, your profit, it's of li limited control in current situations. Why? Because your salary decisions, you know, already I'm meeting out with people who have had some pay cut. Uh, you know, that's why the, the, the various packages have been very useful in helping people um, manage their finances and reduce cash flow at this point in time until December 31st. So really, really, if you look at this, right, where people go to uh, if they need funds are two areas. Loans, I mean, you know, basically to borrow money. So secure loans are loans against assets, maybe against a, a, a property or other shares that you want to pledge it and then you get some loans, right? Or if you, do, if you choose not to sell your shares, you can do all these things. Unsecured loans would be things like loans on credit lines or cash lines, on credit cards, even friendly loans from family and friends. Okay, I would, I would classify under this, okay? Now, really, if you look at all these areas, right, generally the sphere of control, where you can control, is within this area, right? If you need funds, if you don't have savings, if your salary, bonuses, profits are affected, literally you can only look at your loans, okay? So this is where I'm going to be coming from, but uh, it is not, this discussion we have today is to share with you information that we hope you find useful, okay? So let's look at this now, before I start, okay, let's look at Credit Bureau. Um, if you can put your chat groups or Q and A, you know, uh, whether you know what the credit bureau report is, you know, that'll be good, right? Whether you've seen it before, you know, if you want to comment, it's fine, okay? Essentially, a lot of clients I meet are not aware of what their credit bureau reports look like. Uh, a lot of them would have, uh, when they borrowed money the last time, would have had a copy and probably it's two to three years old, okay? So let me just share with you what the credit bureau report looks like. I'm using a sample one that the Credit Bureau in Singapore provides uh, from their site. There's a lot of information that you can see of the Credit Bureau report. So if you look at this, firstly, is your IC number and your, and your name, right? And when you started your credit history. So all these things will be captured. It talks about uh, whether bankruptcy proceedings have been taken against you. It talks about what kind of uh, loans you have, you know, how much you have, it, it surprising, there's a lot of detail. So if you haven't done so, please go and buy a copy. It's only $6 plus GST. Uh, if you've uh, taken a credit line out in the last maybe uh, month or so, last 30 days, you can get the credit report for free, okay? The other thing is this, right? If you look at the credit bureau report, there's a scoring. Now, nobody really knows except for credit bureau how the score is computed, but the scores represent a risk of default, meaning if I were to go to the bank and I'm an AA, right, or BB in this case, then the risk of me not paying back the loan is 0.28%. Now, this declines, right? Your, your score will decline as your probability of default goes up. So they'll come to a certain point in time where the banks will say, I, I don't want to lend you because I'm not comfortable, okay? So all this is internal. 
uh, we don't, it's not transparent to anyone outside the bank. Okay. Um, the, the way the credit bureau is going nowadays, we just have to look at the US to see where it's going. So US is about 30, 20 odd years, 30 years ahead of us, right? Right now they use credit bureau to price uh, loans. So if you are higher risk, they will price you more expensive and so on and so forth. I believe, and it's only my belief that this is where we are heading. Already we are having credit bureau for, for phone lines, for utilities, okay? Another thing is this, when you look at this, right? You realize that if you have a debt, ma uh, debt management program, in other words, I borrow money from a bank and I have problems paying the bank. If I go back to the bank and, and rework the loans, right? All this information will be stored in credit bureau, okay? If you, are, if you have had your ID stolen, okay, your identity stolen, all these things will be in here. It also details loans that you have from which bank and how much, okay? If you paid late, all the behavior, it's like the matrix, you know? When you read the, 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 the whole report, um, the experienced bankers will be able to paint a picture and oftentimes uh, they are able to predict uh, quite accurately financial uh, difficulty. Okay, so why am I talking about all this credit bureau, right? I think, first of all, you know, when you are looking at loans, right, the banks will look at the, your credit bureau. So that's why I'm, I need to talk about that tonight. Yeah, a lot of people will not have seen the reports or don't understand the implications. Now, if you look at all this, you know, you realize that uh, there's a lot of, uh, of, of companies that are not affected, right? A lot of companies, my favorite restaurants have been closing. Right. Um, I recently was in hospital. I met a whole group of SIA people, right, who are working there, and I have a lot of respect for SQ staff. Why? Because they were helping clean patients and all that. But one of the things that that I took out of that stay in the hospital was that they were concerned about how the future will look like. They don't know what future looks like. So there's a major fear, right? Um, we talk about all the packages that support uh, wages, right? Yesterday or was it yesterday or the day before? They talked the, the minister talked about uh, the, the uh, fortitude package, right? So all these things, it supports us, okay? And uh, right now we are within the, the circuit breaker. So all these things shows that uh, we are really in a, in a state that, that we, we need to be prepared financially. So what are we gonna be covering today? Okay, so firstly, how to take advantage of lower interest rates, um, cash flow strategies, how to build emergency funds, consolidate loans, and finally how to prepare for opportunities. Now, I'm not going to be covering very uh, deeply all the points because I don't have the time for, the, for that. I'd rather spend the time answering your questions. I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's move on very quickly. Okay, let's, let's uh, move on very quickly and take a look. Excuse me, well, time and again, I'll look at my, my phone. Why? Because the uh, questions are, are pumped through there for me and, and all that, okay? So let's look at it. Let's talk about interest costs, right? So interest costs are uh, impacted by certain areas. So first one is the loan amount. A uh, 1 million loan would have uh, more interest costs than a 100,000 loan, right? All things being equal. Similarly, loan tenure is the number of years of a loan. So a 5-year loan will have less interest than a 30-year loan. Interest rates, obviously, right? 1% loan will be cheaper than a than, 5% uh, loan. And then the type of loan. Now, this one doesn't really impact interest costs. What it does impact is volatility. Now, in Singapore, fixed rates are from two, three to five years, there, thereabouts. In the US, UK, Australia, we're looking at, when they say fixed rates, they mean a 30 year fixed rate. So in Singapore, it's slightly different. But really, whether you take a fixed or floating rate, there's no such thing whether it's right or wrong. It, it really suits your personality. Some people cannot stand volatility and therefore uh, it makes sense to go into fixed. And of course, de depending on the economy at, at that point in time, okay? So uh, let's move on. I think the best thing to do is to, let's talk about an, an interest rate example. So Mr. and Mrs. Tan, right? Took a loan, 1 million, 25 years, and uh, the interest rate is 2.5%, right? The monthly installment is 4486. Now, don't worry so much about numbers. I'm just showing you the concept. So if you look at this, right, the, the, uh, okay. 
so I really having quite a bit of questions coming in. But let's look at this. 4486 is the monthly installment, right? So three years later, Mr. and Mrs. Sun says, hey, I can bring my loan down to 1.8%, right? So they go and refinance, right? 25 years in the beginning, minus three years, it becomes 22 years. Now, I'm going to be talking a, a lot about three years. Why? Because banks typically ask that you stay at them for three years before you can refinance uh, without cost. So I'm just going to use that as an indication. Okay. So if they move over, the monthly installment drops to 4178, and then the savings huh, is 308. So after 12 months, it works to about 3,007, right? Or close to a month worth of uh, installment times three, that's about 2.7 months. Now, can I ask you a simple question? I mean, if you have savings of 308 from the, the, the property, what would you do with it? Now, in so many years that I've dealt with clients, usually clients tell me, well, oh, 300 bucks, oh, well, my cash flow during the month will be easier. So they'll tend to spend on an extra meal for the family something that they've been planning to buy, right? It eases up on cash flow that allows them to do that. But what if I propose something different? Mr. and Mrs. Tan has been paying this 4486 for three years. They are used to paying it. What if when they move from bank A to bank B, they continue to pay 4486? So let me explain. In every bank when you service your loan, they give you a savings account, right? So in bank B, when they refinance, they will get a savings account. So instead of transferring 4178, what if they continue to transfer 4486? All of a sudden, uh, every year, without even thinking, they will accumulate 3,007. So if this figure is $5,000, then the figure will be substantially higher, right? Now, a lot of clients over the years have told me, oh, you know, I save when I first get my income, I save on a, at the end of the month, you know, and then they try and, and, and struggle through that. But this is a very powerful tool to, to talk about cash flow, okay, to save money. They can spend the rest of their money, you know, but all of a sudden, at end of year one, they will have a lump sum there, right? So it's very, very powerful, okay? So this is something, if you take away nothing, this is something that you should uh, look at it and say, okay, this is something worthwhile uh, considering and bringing in, okay, along with you. This is a very powerful strategy. So now, for those of us who bought new property, right? So when you buy a new property, HDB and private, when you go and take a loan, right? The maximum number of years for me to take 75% loan for HDB is 25 years. For private is 30 years, okay? But in the act itself, the maximum number of years for HDB is 30 and the maximum number of years for private is 35. So there's a five year difference, right? And this five years you can take advantage of when you refinance. Okay, not when you purchase. Huh? You must refinance in, your, in order to stre uh, stretch it up. Okay, so of course it's dependent on the age, right? So if, if let's say the person is, is older and they want to stretch out to 30 years, it may not be possible because those rules exist for a reason. Okay, so let me give you the example, Mr. and Mrs. Tan again. Okay, very simple. So 4486, you recognize that number. Let's say Three years later, they say, I'm going to refinance to another bank, right? And I want to refinance to 27 years. That's 30 minus three, because three years have passed. Just to show you the powerful impact huh, that this has, is if you look at this, 3866 becomes an installment. And what happens is that every month, they save $620, okay? And over a year, it's close to two months worth of installment. Now, I'm not talking about interest here, okay? I'm not talking about interest. I'm talking about cash flows, which is very, very important to manage. And if you read the COVID-19 reliefs that the government has talked about, it, they talk about giving you um, freedom to manage your cash flows. That's why until December 31st, you don't have to pay your loans. It's to free up your cash flow, okay? Now, if like the previous example, they managed to bring their interest rates down to 1.8%, then you see the cash flow improve to 900 over dollars, okay? Cash flow wise, all of a sudden they save three over months a year, times three, that's close to 10 months worth of money, okay? Without even thinking. So this strategy is very, very powerful. Um, 
I'm not again talking about total interest because total interest using strategies, you can manage it. Okay, you can manage uh, interest. So later on, I'll show you with you a story. I met a client. Okay, uh, and and how how the strategy helped her. Okay, so if you look at this, right, you realize refinancing is a very easy way to create emergency funds. You don't have to work very hard at it. It's automatic. You just have to do it once. Okay, why? Because when you set up the, the, the standing instruction with your banks, just do it and then you don't have to think about it anymore. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, now, you know, property group finance deals and home loans. Why? Because we are uh, part of a, 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 the market leader, right, in, in Singapore and the region. But so why am I talking about unsecured debt? So let me explain to you, then you understand what I mean, okay? So this is a wonderful example that I, I picked off uh, MAS and Sunday Times. So three persons, okay? First person, Mr. So, Ms. Chua, and Mr. Lim, right? Mr. So basically pays back his uh, minimum sum every month for his credit cards. Ms. Chua pays back minimum sum plus 20, uh, $200. Mr. Lim pays back minimum sum and draws out $200. So simple example. Minimum sum is normally computed 3% of outstanding loan of $50, whichever is higher. Okay, so if you look at this, uh, Mr. So would have paid, after paying off the loan, he would have paid $190,000 and taken 37 years. Okay, Ms. Chua would have taken 12 years, so she says 25 years and still pay $120,000. All this from paying $200 more each month. Mr. Lim, if you look at this one, nice, it looks like it's the same, but actually he goes deeper into debt. He never ever gets out. Okay. He will basically, you know, carry this debt forever until he passes. Okay. So why do I share this example? Why? Because a lot of people will, in this current situation, be caught in debt. Why? Because when people are, are trapped, they say, okay, I don't have cash flow. What do I do? They will go to the banks. It is the last resort that. Uh, uh, people take to borrow money from friends and family usually it's only when they are desperate in it and when they do that okay so and this is not because they are bad spenders and all that. things happen life happens people lose jobs people lose income okay so it's very important to understand that okay now under COVID-19 rules right um, there's some sort of protection if you drop your income by 25 percent meaning let's say you earn 10k it drops below 7,005 you can go to the banks and you say, okay, I want to uh, get a term loan, move my 25% loan to an 8% loan, okay? But some of the points are, you look at this, if you compare with a home loan, is this. So firstly, monthly unsecured loan amounts are high, okay? Of course, compared to credit card, it's low, okay? But when you compare to home loans, it's high. So let me show you an example. This one is a 100K loan for five years. The installment is $2,000 for the, the term loan about thousand seven for the, the housing loan all right so already cash flow wise is better next thing is interest costs on unsecured are higher so if you look at this right even though it's eight percent you still pay seven thousand over so can you imagine uh, if it's on 25 percent how much interest you are paying if you roll balances if you take it against a home loan it's about thousand four all right thousand five the scary thing is this if you look at the whole loan tenure right for the home loan it's four thousand over dollars that is still cheaper than your year one rate for your term loan. So that's something that is very, very important to know. It is expensive no matter that it's 8%. Okay. The other thing is this, I, I'm going to move along quicker because uh, you know that, that I need to move on so that you can ask questions. Now, this will impact a lot of people. Why? Because husband and wife, maybe the husband loses his job or his income is affected. Right? But people normally look at income from a family point of view. Right? So the wife cannot go to the bank and say, my income dropped 25%. You can't. So what can you do? You go to the bank and you say, I want a term loan. Right? Meaning, you still lend me 100000 over five years. I pay every month. And, and you look at it, it says, it says 8%. But actually, it's not really 8% because this method of calculation is called the rule of 78. 78 because it's 1 to 12 months. When you add all that up, it becomes 78. When you pay off in the first year, after the, during the after the first year, your real interest is about fourteen percent. This is something like a car loan, same method of calculation. It's only when you stick for the full five years that the interest is eight percent. It's not cheap. 
okay so you pay off early you get hit by higher interest okay effective interest so again con continue to 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 ask your questions uh. uh loan consolidation so i showed earlier about the interest rates right uh, we were talking about uh the calculations so if i look at the average uh, cash line right that's about 20 percent average credit card is about 26 27 percent okay the home loan right now is below two percent so you are talking about savings of 18 percent or 20 to 25 percent if you use your facilities for your home to pay for your your credit card debt now important thing to note uh, is that if you do that and you are blessed to be able to do that it's important to stop using on your credit card i've seen a lot of situations where clients continue to uh, use that credit card because they, they refinance they say oh you know i can breathe so they forget end of the day they end up with high credit card debt and high home loan debt worst case scenario right uh, the other bad point is that this one cannot it's not available for hdb properties okay so about 70 percent of the 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 uh, uh well singapore is about 80 percent for 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 hdb right and most people use cpf uh, to service their hdb so our sentiment survey showed about 70 percent of of uh uh of all buyers for hdb properties use cpf right so if they allow you to do that it's like taking money out of cpf right back door okay so that will never happen for those clients who do that unfortunately if you want to help uh, you want to manage the situation is to sell off your HDB and move it into a smaller property. Property you can always upgrade later. It just makes no sense uh, to to pay interest at that kind of levels. Okay. So okay, now um, I'm managing time quite well actually. So these are the common questions uh, that uh, that I get from clients that my colleagues have gotten from clients many years. So first of all is what is the best loan right now? so when they ask that question what they are asking really is what is the cheapest rate okay and and so there are there are a couple of points i want to to, to stress to you so first thing is when they look at, at lowest rate uh, theoretically it means only one loan is best in the market at one time right it doesn't make sense okay why because when you look at interest rates and you look at loans uh, it has got to tailor to the person so let me tell you a story a client of mine came when i was still in banking right and she came in, her criteria was this, Paul, I want the cheapest loan. I want the smallest loan. I want to pay as much as I can every month. Okay, so that's her criteria. Now, a lot of bankers, a lot of, you know, I mean, it's common market practice that if a client asks for that, you just give it to them, right? Then how do they compete? They compete on lowest rate. And that's why it's very tempting when you look at rates and you say, oh, it's cheap, so it's good. So when I talked to her, I asked her, I said, so what's your strategy? What, what are you intending to do? So basically what she shared with me was that, Paul, I don't like debt, okay? I want to minimize that. And it's very logical, right? But I told her, I said, you give your control uh, of your financial future to the bank. When you do it this way, if you get into trouble, the bank decides your fate, okay? So I gave her a different strategy, ended up, she took a full 80% loan. It was substantially lower. The other thing that she, she did was that she had wanted to use all her CPF. I convinced her to keep um, 12 months of, of her servicing uh, in CPF. Okay, just in case something happens, you can use CPF. Okay, so that was concluded. She, she said, okay, since I can manage my interest costs, right, uh, I'll use your approach. Six months later, she comes into the bank. And usually when I'm working in the bank, if a client comes to see you again and asks for you, usually it's not good news. Huh? Usually it's a complaint. But I had this chat with her and she said, I actually came to thank you. So I said, uh, okay, what do you mean? You know? um, so she explained to me that soon after the transaction completed, she got retrenched. Uh, now, bearing in mind, she was working at MNC. She told me she was very confident in herself. That, no, no problem, but she got retrenched. So she asked me, she told me, she said, Paul, I was lying in bed thinking, if I had not listened to you, right? If I had not listened to you, I had just gone ahead and, and, and take the smallest loan, all that. I would not have money to pay off my, my, my home loan. And that, that struck me, you know, that, that how powerful that was been, right? It's very dangerous when you look at your home loan as a transaction because 
it doesn't cater to changes in life. You know, you husband and wife, wife can choose not to work, husband can be retrenched. A lot of things can happen. We look at people as people, you know, and uh, there must be flexibility in your strategy, right? So we, we teach clients how to use the funds, you know, to manage the interest, okay? And which is part of a longer discussion, right? That's why I'm not covering it here. Second, should I use my CPA fund so I can lower the loan amount? So I have this friend who came to me. Uh, in fact, it's very common. They say, okay, should I use my lump sum and pay off? Now, the important thing to note is that their home loan rate uh, was above that of their, their, was below that of their CPF rate. So CPF is paying you 2.5, right? On your ordinary account. So what happened was that uh, when you take money out of CPF, they start computing what we call accrued interest. Meaning if you leave your money in there, you will earn maybe X dollars, okay? If you take it out, you won't earn the X dollars. Then they will say, okay, as you as time passes, you need to pay back. But you not you don't pay back to anyone else. You pay back yourself. It's your retirement fund, okay? So what happens is this. If your housing loan is cheaper than your home loan, then it makes sense, uh, cheaper than your CPF, then it makes sense to leave money in your CPF and slowly take out to pay your, your loan, right? Because you still can make the difference, right? The other point is this, your accrued interest figure will be lower in, in your CPF. So you win, you know, on both counts, okay? Loans from HDB are the safest. Should I just borrow from HDB? Now, it depends on why you're borrowing from HDB. If you are looking at rates, then the answer is no. Why? Because the, the HDB loans are 0.1% above uh, their ordering account contribution. So it's 2.6%. Now, even when rates are very high, right, it did not exceed 2.6%. Okay. Now, the other group of people who are using HDB loans is because uh, they have little cash. So they say, okay, I want to save my cash. I want to use $5,000 to balance I can use from CPF. Then yes, go ahead and use your, your HDB. But when you can, you should look at refinancing. Even fixed rates at 1.8% for five years uh, is cheaper than the 2.6%. You can save a lot of money by doing things like that. So this is what we've, we've been helping about clients at Property Group Finance. The fourth point is I want to borrow the lowest because I want to save interest. That's the most important, right? Answer is no. no. I, I, I explained to you about that client who... who who did that position, right? Uh, about um, wanting to have the cheaper so and it's human nature, right? Um, but you must understand that there's an element called cash flow. So let me give you an example. Mr. and Mrs. Khan just now I told you one million, right? So if I'm their neighbor and I have a five hundred thousand loan, who is better off? You will tell me five hundred thousand loan is better. Why? Because I incur less interest. But that's only one factor, no. The other factor is this: if, for example, I'm like my client, right? I want it to be very short. So every month I pay 15,000, right? Mr. and Mrs. Tan pay 446, let's say, right? Then what happens if I lose my job? What happens if I have the cash flow? Now the COVID-19 release protect clients now, okay? They protect clients now, but assuming we go past the period, then how? You, the bank has to approve that you get into a restructuring and all those things. They have to approve. That's what I mean. You have no control over your life, okay? Financially. That's the danger. Finally, I, I'm interested in the lowest interest rates in the first two to three years. If after that it's bad, I will just refinance. This is the, one of the most common things I hear. Very dangerous also. Why? Because you are assuming certain things. Firstly, you're assuming that when you want to refinance in two to three years, the rates are available, that the market is better, right? So a lot of people pay attention only to first three years. Thereafter, rates lousy, they don't care, okay? The other thing they don't plan for is this. They don't plan that. They don't think that something will happen to their jobs, their career, their life, right? A friend, friends of mine, uh, uh, all of a sudden had five children. Why all of a sudden? Because they had three kids and all of a sudden twins, right? All of a sudden, the spouse says, I don't want to work. Your income is impacted. Another thing I've seen also, like for example, you assume that the laws don't change. So you remember the total debt servicing ratio? A lot of clients uh, were hit that way because they cannot refinance. Or two to three years after that. Why? Because when the TDSR was first implemented, it did not cater to these people. So they were stuck. They didn't have income to refinance and they ended up paying higher interest. So, you know, all these things, we are not transactions. We don't look at things piecemeal. It's very important to look at us as human persons and plan accordingly. Okay. So that's what we do. Okay. 
Now, just like I talk about questions that people ask me, right? These are questions you should be asking yourself, okay? First question is, can I save on my home loan? Chances are, if you have taken a loan three or more years ago, yes, you can refinance. What type of packages and all that? Please don't, don't just look at the first year rate, second year rate, and then be, you know, do that. Don't, because we need to look at the long-term picture. We need to understand what is your plan for life, right? We need to build all these things in. It's very important, right? The other thing is, do I have a strategy to, to build a buffer on my home loans or, or to build emergency funds? I already taught you one strategy. That, that's very powerful. If you don't do anything, do that. Tomorrow, start extending instruction into your, your home servicing loan and just, after all, you'll get used to it and you will forget they have money there, okay? So this is a slow way of building emergency funds, right? Because it takes years to do that, right? But very powerful nevertheless, right? Easy to build 10%. 20%, 30% after a while, okay? This question uh, for about uh, staying with, with clients uh, with, with uh, a property a certain period of time is important. If you want to refinance, you have to ask yourself, do I plan to sell within the next three years? If the answer is yes, then you have to be very specific about looking for the type of loans. Don't be swayed by cheap rates again, you know, or cheap initial rates. Why? Because I, a lot of clients uh, have complained to us, right? Oh, in the past, the banker didn't tell me I have to stay three years. Now I sell the property, it incurs me 1.5% in, in cost, right? So it's important to ask yourself that question if nobody asks you. Now, this one is related to point number two. Do I need to raise a lump sum? Remember just now I told you about example about uh, what happens in, in when people um, lose jobs or income drop, right? I've already had people come to me and say, Paul, I need to raise a sum of money. Interest rates are about 1.6%, 1.5%. It's very cheap. And we also have strategies to help you manage those interests when you don't use the lump sum. But the, the important thing is now to stretch, to, to go over the next two to three years in terms of cash flow, right? We can save money again after that. But right now, we have to protect our livelihoods, protect our businesses to make sure our cash flow. So the way to do it is, uh, looking at equity or what we call term loans to, to manage that situation. Now, a lot of people will, would have had made previous decisions about savings, right? So these are the people who say, okay, it's time to buy. <clears throat> I've had uh, good friends who come to me and say, Paul, I want to buy. How do I structure? Why? Because there's the, the additional buyer stamp duty, ABSD, right? Um, so the legal holdings on the properties need to be managed. So things like decoupling and Different strategies are, are things that we discuss with these clients. Um, <clears throat> we also look at you know, helping them with valuations and things like that. Uh, we work closely with our clients and, and, and we've had very good conversations. So essentially, these are the, the, the points that, that uh, we have. Actually, I have another slide which uh, somehow didn't come out. Ah, there, there it is. I put it wrongly. So the first point is this. You have to ask yourself when you're thinking, uh, if you're not talking to anyone, who has control? Is it the bank or myself? Okay. Now, if I want the control to be myself, then what are the strategies I need to do? Now, again, there's a lot of information. That, that's no way I can download today. Okay. The other way is, is your plan flexible? Does it cater to job losses? Does it cater to things that, that uh, are, are unplanned for? You know, my wife stopped work for a year after our first child. We didn't plan for that. So financially, I was very stressed, you know. Is there anything I can do to automate? Like, okay, so the example I gave you about the automating the, the monthly installments, right? That's powerful. And lastly, am I considering my finance as a whole, my home finance as a whole, not just a transaction? So all these questions will help you to complete the, the, the frame in your mind, okay? Now, I'm going to leave this uh, on this, this page. Scan if you want to contact us via WhatsApp, <clears throat> okay? You can reach out to us, you can email us with, with um, this email address and we will have what we call, call a cash flow check. Why? Because you know it's important to understand what you can save, how you can save in terms of cash flow. Until December 31st, we are, we are protected by the government. During the global financial crisis, there was no such practice. A lot of people got into trouble. Banks, uh, quite a few banks were asking clients to top up their loans. Why? Because the property values uh, had dropped. Right now, they're not allowed to do that. So all these things are, are, are really very, very, very powerful, okay? So 
and, and you know, essentially just have that conversation. Now, whatever we talk about is protected uh, by the PDPA, Personal Data Protection Act, right? So the information stays between us. You share what you want to share, right? But you know, if you go to a doctor, you tell him you have a headache and don't allow him to examine or have a conversation with you, then it becomes more difficult for the doctor, okay? So let's look at the questions, okay? Uh, wow, quite a few questions. Now I'll try and to go, I'm, yeah, I have until 8.55 to do this, okay? So bear with me. So from uh, Boonwi, okay, Boonwi, are you able to explain how the bank calculates the extra interest incurred for a home deferment scheme? The loan deferment scheme I'm assuming you're talking about is the deferment until December 31st. Very simple. Um, <clears throat> wow. 17% based on the calculation was still extra amount of 2008 for the loan amount at 5,005. So I'm not quite sure which loan you're talking about. Are you talking about a home loan or a credit card debt or all that? I, I'm not very clear, but the deferment uh, can be calculated based on the rate of your, of your loan. So for example, let me give you an example. If you have a 100,000 loan right, that you're not going to pay from for a period of time, then it's a matter of taking the, the interest rate times the loan, the, the principal amount divided by 365 times the number of days. That's your interest. Okay? Can't run away. The one is math. math huh? Okay? Um, I mean, Bungui, please reach out to us if you need more one-to-one -one and you know, we can look at it and we can help you look at it. Okay? But certainly, they, all these things cannot run away. The numbers are there. Okay? AK. I took a loan recently and the, they increased the bank rate. What are my options? Ah, okay. You took the loan recently, right? So which means you are probably within a lock-in period. My advice is to look at the terms carefully. Secondly, they didn't quite increase the rate yet. What they have done is they have increased the floor rate, right? Meaning they say, okay, if it drops to below, uh, I think 0.8 or 0.9, right? That figure that they tell you, then they take a minimum of that figure. Okay, net rate uh, in terms of net, if you combine the two, it could still be, be viable. Now, we don't encourage um, one to be angry about the rates. Uh. <laughs> Just work out the sums and if it makes sense to switch, we are happy to help you with that. And also, come to us, we will, uh, come to us with your offer letter so we can know how to advise you. Now, remember, it is likely if you want to refinance, they will, it will cost you 1.5%, right? So, I think the 1.5% rate, uh, when you incur on a loan without the, uh, you know, it, it's going to cost you. So it may not make sense to do that. Okay. Uh, Karen, extending the loan from 27 to 25, isn't it? Yes. No, from just now, the example is 22 to 25, right? Mr. and Mrs. Tan, the extra five years, yes, it pays the lower, you, you end up paying more interest if you don't do anything else. But remember, the strategy now is to manage cash flow. If I tell you this, if over a period of uh, two years, first two years, right, you pay less per month, but you gain more um, emergency funds, you know, you build backup funds in case you need things for your home and, 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 and you know, medical bills, whatever, that is very important. You can manage interest by doing partial payments and all that. You can work out numbers to show you how to do it, what's the strategy to do it. Okay, please, you know, that's the danger, uh, dangerous development. Over the years that I've been in banking, right, really a lot of clients have done that. I, I had a client come to me and say, Paul, you know, I want the cheapest rate. Again, <laughs> very common. But turns out he's a businessman and when he does business, he, he borrows on his business 6%. So I told him, I said, look, don't look at it as a transaction. Manage it, it to, together. So by doing that, uh, I actually saved him something like 4%. He ended up taking a more expensive loan when compared to another bank. But because of the strategies I taught him, he saved a lot, 4%, right? So, yes, you are right. Total interest will go up. Right? But cash flow drops and there are strategies to manage the interest. That's why that lady yeah, who wanted the cheap loan, right, came to me. When I explained to her the strategy or how to manage, she, she, she took it because it still helped her to save money. Although the interest 
cost was slightly more than the, the, the her strategy, she retains full control over her funds. So can you imagine she had no money in CPF? She was, one thing I didn't mention was she was supporting her aged parents. So she said, you know, I, I really cannot, cannot imagine. Uh, thankfully, she got a job soon after. So that was good. Why is the difference, Joanne? Why is the difference between board rates, fixed deposit link or cyber rates? Well, these are just ways that the banks measure um, the variable rate. So what, let me give you a bit, a quick history of the, the interest rates. In the past, uh, banks used to love to do board rates and people were okay with it until I think 2006. And so what happened in 2006 was that the, the cyber rates were dropping. Cyber rates are rates at which banks lend money to each other. Okay. So when that happened, uh, uh, people are expecting rates to come down, but, but board rates uh, increased about six times during the year for all the banks. So people are very upset. That's why the cyber rates came about. All right. And, and people say, oh, it's so transparent. Right? That's why people went there. Then when cyber rates started going up, people say, wow, it's so expensive, right? Then the bank say, oh, fixed deposit rates are more steady. That's why they measure all these things um, and, and they, they release that. So that's the, the main difference, okay? But essentially, they're all floating. Uh. Basically, the only thing is board rates, bank can control. Cyber rates, uh, cyber rates, they cannot control. The association, association of banks control that, okay? The, the fixed deposit rates, obviously, will be controlled by the bank as well. Okay, I hope I answer. My loan just kick in. What is the refinancing? My loan just kick in. What is the refinancing option now? It depends on uh, LH. It depends on whether you have um, a lock-in period or not. Uh, that's the main thing. And depends on what kind of loan it is in. If you are a progressive drawdown, you buy a property, but you know, you haven't moved there, you haven't obtained TOP, temporary, temporary occupation uh, license, right? You, you haven't moved in, a lot of factors determine that. But generally, in most times, you, you are stuck for a period of three years, right? But we can talk about that if you, if you need help. Okay, Elvin, please share about cyber floating fixed rates for my refinancing option next. How should we consider so really, it's a question of expectations. Do you think interest rates are going to go up over the next three to five years? Because fixed rates are fixed only for three to five years, right? So if you think the interest rates are going to be low, it may not make sense to go to fixed rates. But you know, I, it really depends on you. Are, are you comfortable with bearing that kind of, of volatility? Because rates will move. But if you are looking at cyber rates now, please move fast, okay? Because the banks, um, from what I understand when I look at it, the banks are, there are two elements to any loan, okay? One part is the rate itself. The other part is what we call spread. So the spreads are changing and it's volatile. You don't know how it's going to go, but right now the rates are quite attractive. If you are looking to do that, we can help you with that, okay? Um, uh, I mean, really it depends on, your, on your, your risk tolerance. Okay, Alvin, I hope I've answered your question. Zini, that's a nice name, Zini. Should I get HDB or bank loan for 180K? If I take a bank loan, do I need to have a job during refinance? Yes, I mean, refinancing, they generally low income. Um, the other point is this, um, not only do they look at income, if you don't have an income, you can substitute using uh, deposits and things like that. There are various ways of doing it, but also, you know, there are moving costs, right? So. When you are looking at refinancing, you have to look at things like legal fees, valuation fees. We look at that and say, does it make sense for you to move? We'll work at all these things. It, it, if it doesn't make sense, we'll tell you so. Uh, don't, don't move. I just had this conversation with this uh, a good friend of mine last night and, and he, was, he wanted to move. So I calculated, I said, you, you will lose money if you do that. Stick on and just finish paying it, you know, uh, or, and ask the bank to, to help you out in terms of the rate. And that, that, you don't have to move to save money sometimes. Huh? Sometimes you have to move lah, because you want to have extended loan tenure and things like that. Different strategies require that. Okay. Um, you cannot switch from a bank loan to HDB. No one you move from HDB out to bank loan, you cannot switch back. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's the thing to, to take note. Caroline, is the interest payable based on the borrowed amount or the interest calculated monthly based on an outstanding loan. 
is there offset accounts in Singapore? Yes, there are offset accounts. I'm assuming you're talking about home loans. Uh, the loan, the interest is always based on the outstanding. Uh, the, 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 okay, so I'll give you an example. I, I don't quite know where you're coming from with that, but let's say if I borrow a million, right, and, and it's for a property that's been constructed, right, and maybe 300,000 has been drawn down, interest will be calculated based on the 300,000. If, for example, I have a million dollar loan, another example, I pay back 700,000, I left with 300,000, interest is computed on the 300,000. Okay, I hope that that's useful for you. Um, I'm thinking of getting a new home in 2020. Congratulations for 2021. If my income has been affected by circuit breaker, but resumes once circuit breaker is over, will the bank lower the amount I can borrow due to the missing income? No, I think there are two factors that the banks look at. One is the uh, your your tax assessment, your notice of assessment for the previous year. The other thing, or the most current one, the other thing they look at is the three most recent months of your income. So if, let's say your plan right, is 2H or 1Q 2021, and let's say you, you get back to office, your income is, it, it resumes, right? It, it will be the last three months. Of course, huh, it depends on what kind of business you're in, whether you're self-employed and things like that. There are, a lot of rules apply. But if assuming that you are a normal employed person drawing a normal income, then yes, they will look at that. Okay, your, your three pay, pay slips and things like that. Come to us, huh? I mean, we can, we can advise you on that. Is there benefit to go through a broker if I want to refinance with the same bank? <clears throat> if you are intent on refinancing with the same bank, then go ahead. Uh, but you see, the thing is this, right? When, when, when you go to, let's say, probably Guru Finance, right? you come to us, we will look at all the options for you, see which one makes sense for you. Uh, we are not selling you a single product. You know? I think our approach here is this, very simply that if it makes sense for you, then it makes sense for you. If it doesn't make sense, we will also tell you. Right? We are here to have a conversation with you and, and you know, we are the market leader uh, in terms of, of our property seekers. Right? Um, we have built a reputation for trust you know, and, and we are a trust platform. So, Come to us so we can have a, a very clear conversation. Okay. I hope I've answered your question. Uh, can you comment on the sell one buy two strategy for properties upgrade? Okay, so that Blanche, huh? so this is a very popular strategy, and um, I've I've looked at it. Uh, the buy, buy one sell two or sell one buy two strategy. Personally, I wouldn't do it with my wife, you know, the, the, in terms of, of such a strategy. Why? Because simply it doesn't suit me. Uh, my risk profile, while I am a risk taker, I only invest in things that, that, uh, that make sense to me, that, that, uh, that I can control. So, of course, uh, investments are risk, risky. So the sell one, buy two strategy, I mean, a lot of people are, are doing that. Uh, so I can comment uh, whether or not it's successful for them because I've seen successful cases, yes. But you know, now are the times where, where under such periods, how will it impact? I, I cannot comment on that. Um, you meant that the, this one is from, oh, Blanche, again. By refinancing and keeping 4468, the savings kept in savings or used to pay down the loan. Ah, okay, so it can get a bit confusing, right? The 4486, right, when they transfer, Mr. and Mrs. transfer to another bank, their real installment is cheaper, but they are used to paying 4486. So you just transfer 4486 to the new savings account. The bank will take up, let's say, $4,000. So let's say, uh -huh. Then the 486 uh, will sit in your savings account, right? So every month you do that, you accumulate money without even thinking. Whereas Mr. and Mrs. Tan uh, is so used to paying 4486. So this is a, a trick that uh, you trick your mind, right? It becomes very easy to save money. Okay, you can use the money subsequently to pay down the loan. You can use it for emergency funds. You know, the money will come in useful one way or another. You can use it to invest and all that. That's why I talk about control. The control is yours. The control is not the bank's. If you pay the bank, you shorten the loan. You pay the higher amount. You have no control over how you want to use the funds, right? Because the funds go towards the bank to pay down the loan, right? That's what I mean about control, right? Um, for refinancing of HDB property, Carol, 
uh, is it better to consider floating on fixed rates and what are the pros and cons? So I mentioned, right, A is your personality type, B, what your expectation of the market is. Based on my profile, I look at the loans and I think that based on current circumstances, rates will be low. But that's just my opinion, right? Uh, a lot of people may not agree with me, right? Some people will say, I prefer to have fixed, you know, just in case, right? And so it's a question of working out the numbers and see what makes sense for you. If you think that, that it, it suits you, because I have clients who go floating uh, and then call me very often and say, oh, so how the rates went up by 0 0.01, you know, that kind of thing. So obviously, when I spoke with her last time, I gave her the options and explained very clearly. She wanted the low rates, but she didn't want the, the risk. So, so that's the, the question that one needs to answer. Okay, we still have about two more minutes. Um, and then, uh, and then we can we can uh, start to wrap up the rest of the questions. If I don't get to, I apologize. But we will come to it uh, when you can over the next few days. Okay, for refinancing notes. Okay, so that's that is Carol. Carol, I've answered you that question. How to reduce ABSD for second private property when you cannot decouple the first private property? So the question is: this, Are you planning to sell your first property, um, Nicole? If you're planning to sell your first property, there is a six months period firstly. Secondly, the COVID-19 reliefs give you a deferment period for that. I think they extend it by additional six months. <clears throat> so it really depends on your circumstances um, and, and what you plan to do. Certainly, if you're planning to hold two properties, then ABSD, you cannot run away. Okay, it's a question of when, uh, at least for now. Okay, Jeffrey Lin. Jeffrey, I'm out of a job recently, so no more regular income for now to refinance my existing loan, housing loan. So, well, well it, it is challenging at this point in time. Um, when you refinance and you do cash out, uh, the banks look at two elements. One is your job uh, and therefore your income or in lieu of income, uh, your, your deposits. So if you are able to show financial assets, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure your, your position now, but unfortunately the banks operate within those very narrow parameters. Okay? Very narrow parameters. I, I'm sorry, I can't give you more of an answer there. I bought, and this one is for Colin. Okay. I bought and fully paid my HDB. Can I take a term loan of 1.5% and pay back my accrued interest so that I push term? Ah, sounds like a financial planner, huh? So he, he says, can I take the loan on the 1.5% and then use that to pump into the 4%? Remember I mentioned that CPF uh, for HDB properties, you cannot do cash out. That's like a backdoor withdrawal of CPF, right? So unfortunately, you can't do that. You can do that for a home loan though, okay? Uh, for a private property home loan. Okay. Will interest rates stay low? How low and how long? So <laughs> $64 million question. I think it's important to understand and think about the world because it's global issues. Will it, high interest rates help the economies grow? Uh, my guess is not. Uh, how long? I can't say. Uh, it's my personal view that interest rates will stay low for a period of time, right? at least a couple of years. But that's my view. Okay. Hi, Paul. Between building cash flow and selecting a home loan with shorter period, how would you suggest finding the right balance between the two if the individual has, has sufficient savings to last one to two years without income? So that's a very good question. The trick, uh, if you don't know, is to is to be conservative, right? Um, what you want to be doing is is because there's no, you're assuming that there's no job. Um, if you have no job, it will be one to two years without income. But you, have you predicted things like um, cut sudden cash outflow? You know, uh, you, if you're talking about day to day, that's one thing. Uh, one to two years is a fantastic, fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, position to be in. But you know, the thing is, this things can happen, right? I've seen cases where people uh, in the banks uh, came to me, fantastic cash position in six months they were in trouble, right? Because things pop out, you don't know. Okay, uh, so I will, I, sorry, Raymond, you know, if you, if you want to have a, a specific discussion about your scenario, we can do that because 
then I can understand all the various pieces. No, I have to now basically um, stop here, okay, because there are a lot of questions I think I, I, I can't answer. There isn't enough time. I'm sorry, we only have an hour. But certainly, please continue to ask questions, you know. If you have questions for us, you know, uh, reach out to us, you know, talk to us, and, and uh, you can you can go via WhatsApp, you can send us an email, you know, um, we will be glad to help you answer these questions. Now, please, hopefully, that when you take this information that you hear today, tell your good friends, tell your, your families, if they are already beginning to suspect, and trust me, they will know, right, that financially they will be impacted within the next six months, this is the time to have the conversation. The conversation should not be had when their credit bureau is already damaged, okay? When they, you know, and they can't take additional loans to manage a situation. The time to discuss, to think about is now and to consider the various options. Okay, so I think I think it's really, really important to, to, to look at that uh, right now. Okay, so let me see. That's my summary that uh, I put wrongly, sorry. Okay, Q&A. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm Paul, Paul Wee from uh, the Property Guru Group. I'm uh, Managing Director of FinTech and also I run Pro Property Guru Finance. Uh, excuse me if I'm uh, not very perfect in my presentation or all that, but like I said, this is a conversation that we're having and a really important one. So thank you very much for taking the time and thank you for, for um, spending your, your precious hour with us. Please continue to give us questions please continue to give us feedback. If you think that the session was too light or you wanted to hear something else, you know, give us feedback so that we can plan for more things in future, okay? So don't be afraid to pen me or pen us if you think that, oh, the information is, is too light. Huh? So just say, don't worry. That's how we learn. So thank you very much, everyone. And I wish you a safe night and pleasant night. And uh, please do continue to keep safe and keep well. Thank you.